Hello and welcome to PKF Francis Clark's 2024 budget webinar. It's great to see so many of our clients and professional contacts joining us once again. So thanks very much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Well, we were expecting tax cuts ahead of a general election in yesterday's budget, and we did indeed get some tax cuts, although not for everybody. Was this the last fiscal event before the general election? Was it the last time we'll see Jeremy Hunt delivering a budget? If so, what will be his and Rishi Sunak's legacy? Was it really a tax cutting budget? And if so, will yesterday's tax cuts have to be reversed after a general election, whoever wins? Over the next 45 minutes, I'll be discussing some of those questions and more with um, John Endicott, our head of tax and author of the book Furnished Holiday Lettings, a tax guide. Um, a top read. I believe it's still available on Amazon. Um, it's still available. Always a good read. Good. I'm sure it is. Uh, I must confess I haven't read it cover to cover yet <laughs> myself, John, but um, I must go to that before they abolish the uh, the entire regime, which no doubt won't um, help your book sales. Um, Indeed not, probably, yeah. But um, aside from that, we'll also be discussing some of the bigger issues and where we go from here after yesterday's announcement. As always, uh, we will be putting your questions to John a bit later on in the webinar. So please do post those in the Q&A in the usual way. So John, um, welcome along. Um, in the lead up to yesterday's budget, there was a lot of the usual speculation about how much headroom, if any, uh, the Chancellor would have uh, to find some money for tax cuts. Um, perhaps we could start off by just recapping uh, what his fiscal rule is, how it works, and, and um, how much headroom he did have in the end for things like the National Insurance Cut, which was probably the big headline announcement. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think it's interesting to it's interesting to start there and to kind of look at it. So we we can get into all the the kind of details about the way the fiscal rules are drafted. They were drafted after the the Liz Truss and Quasi Quartang shenanigans, and the government didn't have much room for manoeuvre. And the idea is that you're allowed to have debt rising for four years of a period as long as it's kind of falling at the end. Um, so it's not it's not a hugely strict and a hugely restrictive kind of rule. But it was designed that way because there isn't much room for manoeuvre and it was trying not to restrict the government too much. I mean, that said, you, you know, there just isn't much room for manoeuvre. And I, and I think, you know, that the graph that you've got up is a good place to kind of start because to, to any normal human being and even those that can see a lot better than me, um, the lines aren't really moving very much and we could touch on all the huge number of variables and assumptions in that kind of basis. You know, you're down to all government spending, all tax revenues, uh, and you're looking out multiple years um, and it's pretty well the forecast in much the same place. And what you'll see there is it's, it, it's pretty well unaltered. So despite all the pressure to find money for tax cuts, um, there really isn't much money in the coffers to be able to do anything on tax cuts. So, yeah, this is a tricky one to try and explain as to how you get there. And it's not been made any easier by the way the figures are put together. And it's faintly bizarre that there are still newspaper headlines this morning of people talking about subsequent fiscal events this year and further cuts in taxes. Um, and, and it seems to lose sight of the realities of what the financial position is. I think the best way to try and look at it, the, the, and this is having had a chance to reflect on it overnight and look a bit more at the OBR figures, if, if we move on to what's happened on debt interest. So um, effectively, on the, on the next slide, and we're, we're looking at the debt interest position here, um, we, we've got some slightly complicated kind of numbers coming through here as a different ones. But broadly, over the next five years, the amount that the government is spending on debt interest is going to be lower than was forecast last November. And it's going to be quite a bit lower, mainly because inflation is down and an awful lot of the government debt is RPI linked. There's also a point here that the base rate expectations are lower than they were at the end of last year frankly, because inflation has come down. So all of this is a story about inflation, and that'll be relevant as we go through this kind of talk. So that's that's still the main game in town and what everyone's focused on. 
And probably the best way to look at this and the way the numbers go, and maybe not worry too much about as we go over to the right and how far out we go, but in 24-25, debt interest, so the coming tax year that, that's about to start, debt interest is forecast to be £17 billion lower than it was forecast last November. And Jeremy Hunt spent £14 billion of that on tax cuts. You, you know, so basically... I mean, the example I was using with someone earlier here is that you're, you're bouncing up against your overdraft limit. The bank cuts the interest rate and you go, woohoo, I've got a bit more money and you use it for a holiday. I mean, I think he's, you know, without sounding too much like an accountant, it's it's not exactly prudent. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to the outlook for, for after the next general election. Uh, later on and, and what, what position the, the next chancellor, um, whoever that may be, will find themselves in. But um, just in terms of the, the, the what you're talking about here, John, the, cha the improvement, slight improvement in forecasts from the OBR compared to November, um, what you're saying really is the chancellor has, has used all of that um, or a large proportion of that um, windfall, if you like, to fund the uh, the changes in national insurance and the fuel duty freeze, um, change to the high income child benefit charge and so on that were announced yesterday. Um, there was, uh, I saw a comment from David Smith in the Sunday Times uh, just on the eve of the budget um, saying, Jeremy Hunt is a responsible chancellor, but a scorched earth approach would be irresponsible. Is, would you say that's effectively what he has done here? I, I mean, certainly we, we've we've used some of the easy potential or easier potential tax rises that are available, and it does look um, it does look very challenging for whoever comes in. And I think we can touch on that later on. You, you know that um, the tax burden is not moving very much by anything that happens here. I mean, there's stories this morning suggesting that there wasn't much of a tax giveaway. Um, it's 45 billion over five years. You know, it's quite it's quite sizable sums of money, mm. but it is to do with changes in assumptions as to the way the debt interest is being calculated. The only thing that really gets you out of the hole here is if the economy grows significantly. And so this is all about GDP and lack of growth, because effectively what we're doing is we there is no room for manoeuvre unless you get growth. Um, which, to be fair, is where Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and others were. It's just uh, have people got a clear plan as to how we get growth, and that's about more than just tinkering with tax rates. Um, mm -hmm. I think we are going to come on a bit later on to look at the uh, what the OBR's assessment is of the impact that these changes will have on the labour supply, because clearly there is a big emphasis on getting more people into work or encouraging people who are already in work to work more hours. Yeah, so, um, and, and yeah, that, 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 as you say, I think as you made the point in your article yesterday, which people can find on our website if you haven't already read it, um, the 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 uh, to change the dynamic on the tax burden, you're saying we need uh, economic growth, and the drivers for that are in other government policies, all in the long term. It, it's all long term stuff, and and actually, you know, whatever we look at on tax policy is all long term. I mean. You know, personally, I think cutting employee national insurance is is a good thing to do and a positive in terms of it. You know, you you're focusing on earned income, the fuel duty. I mean, one of the things about this, and you need to bear in mind on these projections, is the projections assume that fuel duty will go up because that is already baked into the numbers. So if the chancellor wants to freeze fuel duty, as every chancellor has since 2010, you have to find a few billion pounds even before you've started. Um, so there's a slightly bizarre, you know, kind of surreal approach to the way an, a lot of these numbers work. It's probably worth moving on and looking at a bit more of some of the detail of the measures. Um, mm, OK. And then, like you say, we can pick up on the NIC when we talk about the, the labour force more. So, yes, yeah, maybe... of course. So um, there's been a lot of talk um, in the context of the national insurance cut about the uh, the counterbalancing effect of fiscal drag um, and the, the impact of freezing the um, thresholds on income tax. So did you want to um, just give us a reminder of where, you know, where we are in terms of all that, John? 
Yes, I mean, you, you need to be very careful at a lot of the numbers that are banded around on the nightly news at the moment because um, the journalists are finding it hard to get down to to dealing with how you look at some of these changes. So there's a lot of comparisons by tax year um, and there's a lot of comparisons that are saying, well, the 2% cut to employee national insurance in January this year is in the tax year 23, 24, and therefore looking at that against the the freezing of allowances in that year and saying that people are worse off. Um, and then there's also then saying, well, the next 2P is in the following tax year and you've got to look at it against that tax year. Well, I mean, that's fine. But if you look at it on more calendar period or a more shorter period of months, um, you have got a 4P cut in employee national insurance in quite a short time frame. And so people will be better off than some of those numbers being banded around suggest. The other one that needs to be borne in mind here is that the government has pushed up the minimum wage significantly um, and increased it a lot for those under 21. And so broadly, as we have discussed on some things before, you, you'll get to a position whereby for lower paid employees, most of the boost to them is going to come from the minimum wage increases, whereas as you work further up the income scale, more is going to come from the, the national insurance benefit. Um, so I, I think I think some of the comments that you'll hear are a bit churlish and not really quite understanding that actually this is pushing pushing some more money out. It's pushing some more money out to people, most of whom are probably in fairly tough financial circumstances and facing rising mortgage rates. And it's hopefully then going to, to a good place in terms of trying to support the economy and supporting spending. So you can see the logic of it. But, you know, we come back to how are the numbers working going further out? What, what's really happening here? And what's really happening here is fiscal drag or not raising, you know, allowances and thresholds. And, you know, the first two on this slide are just off the OBR's figures. So precisely how the OBR have indexed, you know, but they're, they're a reliable source here. And what they're saying is, well, for the coming tax year, um, if your personal allowance had gone up, uh, you know, in line with, you know, uh, the inflation, you'd be looking at 15,220 as opposed to 12,570, so two and a half grand more. Um, if the higher rate threshold had gone up, you'd be looking at 10,000 pounds more, 61,000 versus 50,000. You know, these are, these are sizable shifts. You know, I mean, on that 61 versus 50, you're talking the difference between paying 20% income tax and 40% income tax, you know, that's a 20% differential. That's two grand of, of tax on that point. You know, they, these are, and that is where the heavy lifting is being done. And we come back to the question as to how sustainable it is. And yet we've already shown you a graph that basically shows we're bouncing up against some pretty soft fiscal rules, even with that. Now, the Chancellor then, he has done something to try and help those caught by the clawed back of child benefit between uh, 50,000 and 60,000. This was a Cameron and George Osborne policy. It was a lousy policy when it was introduced. It remains a lousy policy. Jeremy Hunt's acknowledging a number of the problems with it, that it's unfair the way it works on taxing you know, a single kind of earner all the representations about what a bad policy it was at the time, it wasn't affecting that many people. You know, it was it was kind of being kept at a position where the government could kind of take the bad press on the people it was affecting because it was kind of being managed. What's happening with the fiscal drag is that all these people, you know, many more people have been dragged into this position. And you can imagine that MPs' mailbags are pretty full about it, as would seem quite reasonable. So... You know, there is some progress and they're starting to focus on some things that need to happen. And we'll touch on that more at the end. And I don't have any doubt as to the sincerity of Jeremy Hunt's comments that he would like to do more and he'd like to go further to sort out some of the disincentives. Because, you know, if you've got three kids and your earnings are currently um, just below 50,000 and someone asks you if you want to do more work, the only answer you're going to come up with is no. 
you know, and the same is true when you get to the hundred grand threshold. And these disincentives are having a big problem and they need sorting out, but they are long term problems to to rectify. You know, mm. in that in that site, if you look at it, I mean, the other one just to focus on for all the Yabu sucks noise going on and, and the budget yesterday was a fairly, you know, childish experience in that way. Um, tax rates, actual tax rates have not shifted very much. So what you're seeing here is the consequence, you know, people looking at national insurance and looking at high income child benefit and, and looking at the problems caused by the personal allowance being clawed back. These are all the stealth taxes that have been used by Brown and Darling and then even more so by Osborne, you know, top stealth tax man to to kind of get additional tax revenue. Actually, you look back even to 1997 after 18 years of all the kind of tax cuts and everything we had. OK, there wasn't a 45p tax rate and there was a basic rate of 24 percent versus 20 percent. But you had a 24 percent and a 40 percent rate, you, you know, 27 years ago and you've got 2040 and 45 now they haven't it, it's a much more consistent pattern than people might think is what i would say mm, okay well well thank, thanks for your thoughts on all that john um as you say there are some themes there that we, we will come back to a bit later on but what else was announced in yesterday's budget that caught your eye yes yeah, so i mean we'll come back to the like you say the nic and on the fuel duties really a given type point um the chancellor couldn't get the numbers to add up and couldn't do a 2p cut to national insurance um without raising taxes and broadly the chancellor has gone to any of the consultations that were on the desk of looking like targets that could be raided to try and pick up some more money um top amongst these is the you know the the non-DOM part of the, the position. I mean, there's a whole load here about stealing Labour's clothes. Um, mm. There's also a point for those of us dealing with advising a lot of non-DOMs where many have already been leaving the UK and looking to go to the UK because of impending uh, yeah, Labour government. Um, and so you've already had quite a lot of movement going on. It's quite clever what's been done there, trying to come up with, I, I would say, a uh, probably a better regime based around residency rather than the concept of domicile so then there's only one residence it builds on the statutory residence test that we've had for over 10 years um and then you know one of the bits that helps the numbers here is to effectively try and encourage existing non-doms to bring money to the uk by giving them very cheap tax rates to bring historic untaxed money into the uk and that gets you to a kind of windfall tax type approach, albeit at a lower rate. So for money coming in in 24, 25, you've got a 50% exemption and you've also got a 12% tax rate for two years, you know, for historic unremitted income. So yeah, potentially you could see billions coming in at a 12% tax rate. Um, and that's all already baked in to, to give in the NIC cut for people. Um, quite complex there's a lot of other interactions there there's a lot of detail in it but three billion a year two three billion a year roughly for a number of years you know again very very uncertain though as to how you know that there's a lot of assumptions in that number mm -hmm. and our, our colleague anthony Meehan has written quite a detailed blog on all all this um which you can find on our website if you are interested or, or affected by the abolition of the non current non-dom regime but john um this this all is is slated to take effect in april 2025 isn't it so people who are affected um do have a little bit of time to prepare there, there's time for people to prepare and you know anthony's phenomenally clever and always a good person to to read what he's got to say um karen bowen and other members of the international team sarah brown and others plenty of work we're doing and you know quite a significant part of the client bank and, and plenty of work there so yes you know that that's a big area it's a big area for accountants like us it, it's you know there are 69,000 non-doms in the UK paying the you know paying the remittance basis charge according to HMRC figures you know it, it's a it's a fairly narrow niche for some of it slightly broader but still 
narrow but but significant for us um we've got some property tax changes to try and raise some money these mm. raise about half a billion a year um what's one of the notable things about this that probably tells you a lot is that these are 2022 consultations or 2022 proposals so yeah the chancellor has clearly gone to the treasury colleagues and gone we need to find some more money and they get out their wares and they say well there's this idea and this one that we've worked up so these are ones that weren't front of mind or the ones that the government was first going for but they think well this will work and we you know we need it um, mm -hmm. So stamp duty land tax, you've got multiple dwellings relief, which is a relief designed to compensate people because of the way the 3% surcharge works and where multiple properties were being bought at a point in time that the the kind of slab approach was, you know, that the old fashioned approach was unfair and people overpaid on the property. So you could be buying a number of smaller properties where they would have been taxed at a lower rate. But the overall amount you're spending, you, you you pay more than is reasonable. And this is particularly an issue for people buying, let's say, more expensive country properties or, or, or doing other things like that. There's a lot of work we tend to do on this and around mixed use property. Um, there were proposals to try and reform that regime and, and stop some of the tax leakage. The government's just gone, sod it, let's abolish it. Um, so that's one area that the mm. Finnish holiday lets regime this goes back to a long-standing complication that's been around since the early 80s and therefore was a, a, a Thatcher and government reform where um, furnish holiday lets, you know, even large complexes do not count as trades and therefore the activities are much more heavily taxed historically than a hotel or other businesses of that nature. Um, what the Office for Tax Simplification suggested was that the regime was abolished and that uh, there was a new line drawn in the sand and that certain businesses, you know, like holiday letting complexes. So the kind of place you go to that's got, you know, multiple units on it and looks like not exactly a small holiday camp, but more of that kind of nature, probably got swimming pools, you know, all sorts of children's play activities, various units around, often inland, some of them coastal. Those type of units, the OTS was suggesting that they were moved into the trading category if they met certain criteria. What we had yesterday was the announcement of the abolition of rules going much more broadly, but we haven't seen any concession yet for those businesses. And that will be a worry for an awful lot of Southwest businesses where you know, the rules are potentially going to be penal if they don't get some reform. Um, it's a complex area and different people have different views on it. I'm yeah. sure it is. And I know you've written, as I mentioned, you've written books on the subject. So we could spend a long time on it. We're not going to here, but there, there is more detail um, on the website. But just in terms of context, John, what was the rationale for having a different tax regime for letting out furnished holiday lets as opposed well, to other types of property? It, it's it's because they're not a trade. It's because the courts decided they're not a trade. So um, okay. if if you're if you're operating and you're you, you know you're um, uh, you're running certain types of business, let's say you're running a hotel, that's taxed as trading income. You can pass that on to your children with tax reliefs. You've got you know the furnished holiday letting regime doesn't apply to inheritance tax, but it does apply to capital gains tax. So you get a cheaper rate on capital gains tax. You're able to get gift relief if you pass the property on to to your um, children. Um, what if in the absence of that regime, if you've got, let's say, a holiday letting complex, you know, uh, pick the kind of ones, you know, we've got various businesses around here that deal with that a lot you know the kind of ones that stags are selling maybe a dozen units somewhere in the countryside somewhere children's play facilities owners accommodation um that's the same as landlords doing buy to lets now there is no relief or anything in the absence of this as to how you pass it on and those businesses will then fold or not be in a position to be passed on you, you know that that's the that's where the problem comes in um it's not about second homes it's got um, zero to do with that, regardless of where people go on it. You know? Really? So that's interesting you say that, John, because a, a lot of the um, talk around this was that it would um, help to free up holiday accommodation, particularly in coastal towns and villages. 
for local people to rent longer term. Do, do, do you think it will have that impact or what, what other impacts do you think more broadly? It will have I, I don't think it will have that impact. I think you will see some sales in those areas and I think you might see some, uh, but what you'll probably see is is more straightforward second properties in those areas. So, you know, you could see, anyway, yeah, we, we go off at a tangent into ones uh, uh, and other people will be commenting on that more. Um, it's, it, you know, there's a reason why the rules have been around and there's a reason why they existed originally. They were abolished before in a budget in 20, 2009, yeah, 2009 budget, they were abolished. And then the government, you know, relented and, and changed them. I don't think that's going to happen this time. But if you don't deal with it, there are problems for a lot of Southwest businesses that, you know, it, it just causes problems for. And again, they've got 12 months or just over 12 months um, to prepare for that, haven't they? Yes, although although we haven't got rules announced, there is a reference to anti-forestalling measures. So there are potential problems even for people trying to plan around it, as there are typically on some of these kind of things. So we're in that hinterland where we don't know what a lot of the rules are at the moment. Um, but we will be onto that and dealing with it more. So probably okay. probably okay. enough of that relevant relevant to the southwest a bit but still only 127,000 businesses that are within the furnished holiday letting rules according to hmrc figures um, okay just while we're on furnished holiday lets we have had a question from the audience which, which you might want to answer at this point um thank you jennifer for um for your question um john am i to assume that furnishing and replacing furnishings in holiday lets won't be tax allowable in future uh, that that's the reasonable working assumption. It will be, I mean, what we've been told is it will be the same as any other kind of um, uh, let property, um, and therefore you won't have those reliefs. And of course, the normal let property applies to unfurnished accommodation typically, because that's the way let property is let. Uh, holiday lets qualify for capital allowances. And as has always been said in the past, if you don't have capital allowances on holiday lets, what you like to see is underinvestment in businesses. Um, and that was in a speech where the Chancellor was lamenting lack of investment. You, you know, so you, you, you're as ever left with the complexities of this. But it, it, we need to see the detail of the rules before one draws too much conclusion. Reforming it is not a bad idea. Um, it's it needs to it needs to take account of the businesses of what people are trying to do and and make money and run things for their their local economy really okay indeed well moving on john there are a couple of other points here on the slide that you haven't covered but did you want us to talk about capital gains tax first yeah so so a couple of things on capital gains tax so um the um the residential rate of capital gains tax is falling from 28 percent to 24 percent um and that's due to actually raise more money. So in all that kind of debate about what what level of capital gains tax rate is appropriate, um, the government's figures are suggesting that more money will be raised if the tax rate is lower. Um, so 28 is looking too high and disincentivizing people to to sell. Um, the other uh, the other point on um, capital gains tax that I thought worth mentioning, uh, which is in the OBR documents, uh, paragraph 4.32, um, there was a peak in capital gains tax receipts in the tax year 23-24. This is now expected to fall. Um, and the reason why they think there was a peak was because the Office for Tax Simplification recommended increasing the rate of capital gains tax and that then led to a number of people to take action to try and realize gains um and yeah so that, that was just interesting that even where there aren't changes it's the threat or the suggestion of them that leads to some of the kind of points that might come along mm, interesting um, um, and um, on inheritance tax sorry yes, just, just three tax. points quickly um because we ought to move on but three quick points um one of them is that there are measures included to extend agricultural property relief to environmental land and ecosystems. Um, there's some complications about that on the way that's been suggested of the effective date and the, there's a bit to think about there. And that's certainly a big issue for the um, for our 
uh, agricultural colleagues and, and our agricultural clients um, where they've been encouraged to use land differently. And then the question is, what impact does that have in terms of its agricultural status? Uh, two other points on inheritance tax worth mentioning briefly. The government has made it easier for people to get grants of probate where they can't pay the inheritance tax at the time without having to get commercial loans to pay it. That's in there. And the um, they will move from inheritance tax being based around domicile to being based around residency. They just don't know how at the moment. So I think I think that's a few kind of points there on some of the other measures in the budget. OK, thanks for that, John. Just a reminder, everybody, uh, please do pop your questions in the Q&A if, if there's anything you'd like John to address a bit later on. Um, but moving on, John, there was a lot of discussion uh, following yesterday's budget about the overall tax burden, whether we can genuinely call it a tax cutting budget or not. Maybe, first of all, can you go there for us to just in terms of the overall tax burden, but then perhaps more interestingly, how is that the balance of that burden changed over time and I think we've got a slide which I can bring up for you on that. Yeah question. so I mean I think I think the difficulty you've got here is that there is so little room for maneuver that nothing is likely to alter the overall tax burden. Um, there's a lot of figures in the um, yeah the FT and other publications even, even the Times which is you know um, uh, the, this morning, which are kind of IFS and Resolution Foundation figures showing the tax burden still going up to its 1948 level. Um, the, the difficulty with a lot of this is it does depend how you measure GDP, where the figures are. The reality is we're up to a very high level of tax burden and we're up to the kind of levels where the British people generally get to not really wanting much more than they're kind of up to. So you, you get the where the noises are. I mean, that's not that's not said on any opinion pollster type approach. I'm just saying that if you look back over over when's 1948, you know, 75 years ago plus, um, we're, we're talking that kind of peak and we've gone close to that peak. So we went to a peak in the late 60s that then came down with the early 70s. We go up again in the 70s, but it comes down even before Maggie coming in. We then go up again in the 1980s under Maggie, comes back down again. We've got a bit in the 1990s, a bit under, you know, pretty well every decade we've headed up and then pulled it back down again. Um, so I, I think you get to a point where, you know, that there is... It's hard to see things working, but we've got ourselves into a pickle and it does need a bit of a longer term view as to how we we take ourselves out of here, which is difficult for people with an election in the offing to be able to do. And it's probably something for a future government. Um, it's worth just picking on a few things that might help here. I mean, one of them just just for relevance, is that the burden, the tax burden on kind of working median salary employees mm. is much lower now than it was in the 1970s and 80s. We have moved to a system whereby there is more of a burden on higher earners and less of a burden on lower earners. Back in the 1970s, the higher earners had a high burden as well but they both came down quite a lot. What's happened is the higher earners have gone back up and, and the lower earners less so. Now that may just be reality that cost of living is such that you just, you know, you can't get blood out of a stone. There is only so much money to go around, but it is an important point to bear in mind when people are thinking about the tax base and, and you do need to get to um, everyone being happy that the system's fair. And the danger is that you have a lot of voters voting for somebody else to pay the tax. And the minute you get into that kind of one, you know, sooner or later you hit a problem because we need quite a lot of tax and we need to feel we need to feel that we're all we're all in it and it's all part of it. And this gets to quite philosophical kind of points that are probably beyond where where one should go. But I just it's just helpful to see. That's a resolution foundation slide. You know, you can put the numbers together in different ways. Most of us yes. remember paying those taxes, to be honest. So, you know, you know it. You know. But, Always interesting to look at the historic historical perspective, isn't it, John? Um mm. so yeah, that's what the this slide that we've taken from the Resolution Foundation shows. Um just moving on, John. Um we were talking earlier about the um 
reason for the government focusing on national insurance um, and the uh, the anticipated impact in terms of getting people more people into work did you want to talk about what the OBR suggests might be the impact of that and and some of the other changes that we're seeing at the moment yeah I mean I think I think there's a couple of points here you, you know I, I think it's I think it is commendable that the Chancellor <coughs> is focusing on national insurance and focusing on you know the taxation of earnings um i i think it's also very clear that he is focused on trying to get more people into the workforce now we can go through lots of different statistics but the fact that the obr have such a focus and even parts of their document focusing on expanding the labor supply um and a lot of this comes back to inflation you know, if you look at where inflation is in in the UK, um, it's it's heavily generated by wage settlements with workforces. Um, there's some separate graphs showing that they're expected to still be quite a big rise in real earnings over the next few months, and then that should come back down. And I think the desire is that employers are able to squeeze down on wage settlements, get inflation further under control, keep it under control. That in turn gets the government's financing costs down. It makes everything easier to plan and invest. It makes the economy better. So there's both what you're paying the workforce, but that gets down to supply. And have we got enough workers and have we got workers with the right skills? Um, and the danger is that if you disincentivize those workers, then you're in you're in a problem. So these are some of the reasons why there's been a focus on childcare, you know, way later than there probably should have been, but a desire to get more workers into the workforce and find it easier for people to work. That's some of the reasons why there's a focus on the high income child benefit, but there isn't still yet on the personal allowance. It's why we've had the focus on pension reforms, focused in particular on doctors, but everyone else in terms of disincentives to working and getting rid of the the, um, the lifetime allowance on pensions to try and get people back there. I, I think, in, and yeah, we've discussed this one already, and, it, and it's an interesting one around this, that these measures do help get the workforce up. But what you were correctly pointing out is very interesting, is that uh, freezing thresholds and allowances stops people wanting to work more and reduces down the the labor force you, you know as well mm -hmm. um yeah so i think that is an interesting point there that the obr has, has, has is making yesterday i mean you might have heard jeremy hunt on the radio this morning talking about the national insurance cuts um encouraging another 200,000 people into uh into the labor market which you can see here on the slide um which is which is correct according to the OBR. Um, those changes, John, that you mentioned in terms of pensions allowance, um, childcare, and so on, anticipated to um, increase the workforce by another 124,000 or so. Um, but interestingly, you can see that that's actually just about cancelled out by the impact of um, the fiscal drag effect that we were talking about earlier. There is a there's a line here from the OBR chair's comments yesterday the increase in marginal tax rates for those dragged into higher tax bans is also likely to have a negative effect on work incentives um, which is the first time they've actually tried to quantify that effect we estimate that freezing rather than indexing the allowances and thresholds in the personal tax system since 2022 is likely to have reduced total hours worked by the equivalent of 130,000 full-time equivalent by 28-29 so that's the red line you're seeing on this chart here. Just interesting that there are sort of pros and cons when it comes to trying to increase the, the labour supply. Um, shall we move on at that point, John? I, um, I, I to... think we move on. I mean, I think the point is it just reinforces we're in a hole and it, it's not going to be that easy to get out of it. And it's quite a long, it's a long road back. So yeah, let, let, let's flip mm. on because I think there's some other points here worth picking up. Yeah, there's another issue which uh, I know is always a, a popular topic um, for business owners. Um, and again, you, you touched on this in your blog um, that we published yesterday. But the um, whether whether it's more tax efficient to extract profits from a business by way of uh, paying a bonus or, or taking a dividend. And um, you, you put together some numbers here, which will hopefully give a helpful comparison on that. 
Yeah, so um, I, I updated the numbers yesterday for the latest changes. Uh, I mean, the issue here is about earned versus unearned income. Um, and we've been through a slightly bizarre position whereby, so back in the 1970s and pre-Thatcher, we had things like an investment income surcharge, and there was a clear favor, you know, desire to favor earned income. And then we get into the kind of Thatcherite era where it's seen that they should be treated kind of equally. Um, and then we kind of go through the 1990s with that kind of theme starting to favor some of the unearned income a bit. And then we go into the Labour era and the Brown Blair and actually unearned income gets treated much more favorably than earned income. Um, and that's carried on throughout all the kind of Osborne years up until really kind of um, the 20, 2022 or so. And then suddenly we've had a massive shift in favour of trying to favour earned income, which largely goes back to this um, all about trying to get the wage, you know, the labour force up, you know, these disincentives. Where this is relevant to an awful lot of our clients is the way they take the money out of companies. So, so back, going further back, when I was, you know, had less grey hair and and was young and suave, um, you know, we we did we did lots of partnership accounts and people didn't want companies because of the adverse impact on taking dividends out of companies and close company apportionment and all these very penal rules that stopped people incorporating. We've gone to a position where the vast majority of our client businesses are limited companies um, and many people have favoured limited companies. And one of the attractions to that has been that they've been able to take money out by way of dividends. Now we're hitting a position where for higher rate taxpayers and additional tax rate taxpayers, um, it's definitely better off taking salary or bonus than taking a dividend. You have to do the individual numbers, but it's about 1% or so different for people below state retirement age. If you're above state retirement age, it's even better because you don't pay employee slash insurance. Um, so broadly, that's pretty clear. Where there's still a significant incentive to take dividends is on basic rate taxpayers. But yesterday, that was squeezed down again um, with cutting employee Nash insurance. So we're now in a position where, you know, it's about 5% difference, which on, you know, for the people concerned, that's probably still a couple of grand for a basic rate taxpayer, maybe a bit over. Um, it, it's, it's a significant sum of money across that kind of period. But you can see that going in the next little while. And you could see, yeah, it does depend what rate of corporation tax is paid. Um, but the dividend tax rate for basic rate taxpayers looks quite generous still. And you could see that being, you know, reduced down more. So and there's other factors here that we would be picking up and looking at it. But broadly, you know, if you haven't reviewed how you extract profit from a company, you should be reviewing it and talking to your advisors about it. Mm, OK, good point, John. That brings us on quite nicely um, to um, look more more broadly at the changes that we've seen in the tax system, particularly over the last four or five years since Rishi Sunak became uh, Chancellor at the um just before the pandemic actually um and the point you were making there about the different treatment of earned and unearned income john um yesterday there was a i, I think this is the first time i've heard this phrase but um the the, the government started to talk about national insurance as a form of double tax on work um is that new or have i have i just missed that up until now and is, is you know is that really why they're focusing on national insurance as opposed to income tax well, they might be focusing on national insurance because it's cheaper to cut national insurance. I think they're focusing on it because they want to get the workforce up and we need to. How do you get immigration under control unless you get more people working in many of the businesses? I mean, I think there is a people recognize, I think, the problems and the things we'd like to shift. I'm just not sure it's that easy to shift them. And it's these are very long term patterns. Um, so, yes, I think it is new. And I think we might touch on that a bit more in a moment because, you know, there's been talk over many years of merging the two systems. Um, and I had tended to think that this would be top of Rachel Reeves' list of things to look at now because her non don one got nicked. Um, she's going to need to find something else. And I think you can shift some things as part of doing it. I, I think it's just helpful 
you know, I've called this Rishi Sunak's legacy. It's quite hard to kind of name, but if you look, um, four years ago, we were doing we were doing a webinar like this just as the pandemic was kind of hitting, and that was Rishi Sunak's first budget. Mm. He became chancellor in February 2020. He has been chancellor or prime minister throughout the last four years, apart from three months. So there's a heavy influence uh, of, of what he's done in here. And I think you can, you know, uh, we can see where that kind of puts him. So you, you get to the the first one is the cut in employees' national insurance is very significant. Um, what you miss by looking at 2019 to 2024, where it's gone from 12% to 8%, is that uh, it actually went up to... Th- 13.25% in between of when the course. social care levy came in. So we're, we're talking a 40% cut in a tax since Jeremy Hunt um, became um, chancellor. And I don't think that Nigel Lawson ever achieved that on a main kind of tax cut. He probably might have achieved that on, no, I'm not sure he achieved that on income tax over that kind of time. So, so you have got, you know, for all the rest of it, you've got huge ass, you know, points here, but then you look at what else has happened. Well, corporation tax has gone up, you know, in, in a big way on the main rate to help kind of pay for things. You, you look at the position of higher earners, you know, we've talked about fiscal drag. The 150,000 additional rate threshold was introduced in 2008, 2009. Um, you'd have to index that up. I mean, you'd be talking about a couple of hundred thousand now that should be. And yet, what have we had that done? Reduced to 125,000. So you didn't vote Corbyn, but you got something that looked a lot more like where Corbyn was kind of going on it. You, you know, you then look at dividend taxation. Um, the social care levy lasted, you know, a few months everywhere mm. apart from on dividend taxation where the 1.25 percent stuck um you look at the idea of leaving money behind in companies and then being able to take it out at a 10 percent tax rate and taking advantage of entrepreneurs relief or, or which then became business asset disposal relief and we had a 10 million pound lifetime allowance that was then chopped to a million pound in in sunak's first budget you know so uh, one of the massive incentives for using corporates and corporate structures taken away at that point um and then you know going the other way and we've already touched on you know the pension lifetime allowance you know million and 55 when he came in but abolished so it's it's an interesting mixed bag as to what's happened and it's hard to discern you know much clear strategy or or idea to it beyond this probably focus given to it by Jeremy Hunt of trying to really focus on the the workforce. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's it, it's in, interesting points you make there, John. Um, a quick caveat, I suppose, um, when we talk about Rishi Sunak's legacy, perhaps that should be legacy so far, because we're not we're not making any predictions here about the outcome of the general election, although people will, of course, be well aware of the um, where the opinion polls have been for um, for, for quite some time. Um, but yes, that brings us on, I think, John, to look at um, the future, look at look forwards where we go from here, whoever might be in charge um, post the general election. Um, do you think the yesterday's announcements um, b- make uh, an early general election more or less likely? Do you think we're looking at spring uh, or well, autumn? I, I, I did think that May looked a distinct possibility before, and I've come to the conclusion that it isn't, having been dissuaded by everyone that tells me that it won't happen that way. And I'm so I'm going to stick to it's not going to happen that way. But I, I think the bigger question really remains, you know, what happens on things like the Rwanda policy and whether whether large parts of the Tory party rebel and go to reform or do, a, you know, I, I, yeah, how, how governable are they even for another nine months is... Yeah, who knows? Failing that, I think, you know, we could go all the way out to January, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, I was it's difficult about this to say. because obviously workers will start to see the impact of the national insurance cut um, coming through in the April pay packet. Um, so, you know, if you, if you were to have an election in May, that would be fresh in the mind, whereas perhaps by September, October, people have kind of got used to it and for, forgotten all about um, the changes uh, made by that. Nice, uh, nice man, Jeremy Hunt. Um, but I, I think that the, it's definitely left open, you know, and you can see the attractions of doing it. I just all the evidence is that when people get to it and they have to decide, do they stick or twist? 
you, you mm. know, it, it's hard to jump at that point, really. So just sort of quick thoughts on the, the broader um, scope for reform changes in the tax system. Uh, again, whether it's under a new government or, or, or um, continuation of the Conservatives. Um, one of the points um, our colleague Steve York was making yesterday um, when writing about the high income child benefit charge is there's an interesting shift back to um, taxation be, being um, on a household basis rather than an individual basis. And did you want to did you want to talk about that and, and um, what we're looking at here on the slide as well in terms of the, that overall question you've asked is the tax system fit for purpose and what direction might it be going in? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting, isn't it, in terms of some of the ones here. So, you know, if you read uh, if you read the comments section on any FT article about the um, about the tax system, or even probably in the Times, the the withdrawal of the personal allowance between one hundred and one hundred and twenty five thousand is the number one thing you see mentioned, and then second to that is the high income child benefit kind of references. Um, that was a lousy policy when Alistair Darling and Gordon Brown came up with it. It was obviously a lousy policy. They didn't have, they didn't feel they had much choice. They kind of did it. You would have thought it would have been reformed since. Um, but instead, what happened is once a coalition was formed, it was decided to massively increase the personal allowance. So it was basically doubled over that time. And therefore, it made what was a 10 grand kind of adverse tax band, which wasn't too much of a disincentive, into this very wide tax band before some of the pension changes and other things came along. I mean, it's an awful policy. It's a dreadful kind of disincentive. And the pattern as you go up, the income scale is awful and it needs quite widespread reform. But that needs several years to put it together. I think you probably look to merge national insurance and income tax at the same time because you could actually push tax rates up and move things around and change them a bit. And I think a new government probably ought to look to try and do that because you could you could do it within a four or five year term and have actually got something in place and you know had the tougher conversations um, that you need to do it. Precisely how and where you get to none of this is easy. But we've spoken enough about the fact that you need to incentivize people to want to work, grow, take things forward. And and those are some of the things we're dealing with. And and these ones are, you know, a barrier. The the having tax free childcare that's withdrawn at a hundred thousand only exacerbates that problem. And therefore you can see people not wanting to do that. Um the household versus joint taxation. I got married in eighty eight. Um so you know, when I got married we had joint taxation. Um, you know, we can go through the way that that worked. Uh, there are various people, you know, I've spent a lot of time who, you know, the 1991 reforms were seen as hugely important to uh, as, as part of the feminist movement to, to not have, you know, uh, income aggregated. But it's led to a very curious system throughout that time where you, you look to move income between, you know, other members of the household rather than just being taxed on one household. And the move to suggest that the high income child benefit will be on a household basis, um, you can see the government's heading back in that way. It looks an easier way to raise money to go for household taxation, potentially, once you've got over those kind of barriers. Um, I had tended to think that you could have kind of optional rates, so you actually get slightly more favourable rates to begin with on a household taxation rate. I, I think there's a lot to be done there. And I should think Rachel Reeves has got a book out the library on it, you know, today probably, and is high on her list. What can I do to find more money, basically, you know, and incentivize things? Mm, well, that that is um, an important point you make about the need for more money, which I think brings us on quite nicely towards the end now. Um, the um, OBR has um, published this chart yesterday, which I thought was quite interesting. And uh, they're making the point, really, that um, the Chancellor is able to meet his fiscal rule um, with, by, by a very narrow margin historically currently. But um, beyond uh, the next financial year, we've got no clarity um, at the moment about the, um, the, uh, the government's detailed spending plans on public services. So um, in his comments here, uh, Richard Hughes was saying, so the chart that you can see there, four out of the five years of our forecast for this large proportion of public spending are not based on any detailed 
departmental plans from the government. Um, I think John, thinking about the co the context of you know the, the the pressure to increase spending on public services be be beyond what's already penciled in, where what do you think that will mean for the the, the overall tax burden beyond uh, the general it, election? It, it's difficult. I mean, it, it looks like taxes are likely to be going up, um, and that there will be more tax revenue being raised. The key is to get that happening in tandem with a growing economy. I mean, actually, the you know, I think all the political parties are united on the fact that what they need is growth. Um, the difficulty you've got is that if you if you're Labour and you're elected at the moment and you say, well, it's all jammed tomorrow. I mean, you already read enough that kind of go, well, it's all the same thing. They're, they've got the same policies. There's no different. It's quite hard to know what that looks like. And the policies are. I mean, the policies after the election are probably going to be pretty similar, whoever's in power on that kind of level. I mean, I don't think there's massive differences. Um, the, you know, the way I tend to look at this, if, if I was a company and I've got my lenders providing me money and I was already getting up to my facilities and levels that they felt a bit uncomfortable with and I'm going out to them saying, invest in me and give me more money and give me decent financing, and then this is the only level of detail I can give them. And they look at that and they go, that ain't going to happen. I mean, it, it's just, it's not great. Um, mm. And I think, you, you know, you you get back to this. Um, it's been interesting so far. The government has been able to sell its debt, its guilt. They're selling very well at the moment. But there is a big movement from the pension funds and from other investors coming back into fixed interest having been largely out of it for a long period of time um you i and other people need to be buying this government debt so we are we are investors in all of this and at the moment what's been sold to us is doesn't look as attractive as it should uh, and i think the government's going to need to understand that how does it take the people with them and want to kind of invest and support it and understand what is possible and what can be done um mm. Hmm. Okay, yeah. well, perhaps that 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 um, relates to the uh, some of the announcements yesterday about the um, British Savings Bond, which uh, our colleague Fiona Morrison in uh, Francis Clark Financial Planning has also been writing about, among other things. Um, but we probably don't have time to um, to get into that right now. Um, so we do have a few questions, perhaps to cover just briefly towards the end, um, as 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 we start to wrap up, John. But um, any final thoughts from you before we uh, dip into the audience questions? Uh, no, I, I no, no. That, that, that's far away. I saw one there <laughs> about um, I saw one there about carried interest. Um, hmm. So somebody was asking about the capital gains tax rate on carried interest, which has been the same as residential property. To date, all I've seen announced is residential property, and it would seem unlikely that the government would have dropped that on carried interest. But it was one of the thoughts that occurred to me. But I haven't seen anything suggesting that carried interest would reduce. And indeed, you know, Rachel Reeves is pretty rude about carried interest most most days of the week, and there's desire to up the tax take on the kind of carried interest point here. So, um, yeah, I don't think we've got anything more to share on that at the moment. But OK, uh, I've noticed a couple of people have been asking if we can make the slides available afterwards. And um, yes, we can certainly share those with you. Um, question here from Katie. Uh, going back, I think, to the point you were making earlier about um, earnings growth and um, labour supply. Do you think enough has been done to help support smaller businesses, especially with the increase in the minimum wage? Do you think the government could risk losing the incentive for skilled workers if the gap keeps closing so i think that goes to the point about compression of um salaries doesn't it if you're pushing up the the salaries at the lower end of a, of a scale for a company i mean it i mean it does and it, you know any of us who were uh, remember the 1970s well enough will constantly remember union demands on differentials yeah it was one of the key things that was always kind of discussed and, and we see that on our own workforce on the need that as things come up at the bottom you've got to keep moving them up further up i i think it's a challenge um i yeah the difficulties here we are looking at tough years for businesses um I, I mean, I spoke about the other measures in the budget. There was nothing very business related in the budget. 
you, you know, it's unsurprising in some ways in the run up to an election, but it is largely get on with it. And and that, yeah, that's an economic view. And it might even be a right view to say, well, it's not the government's job to, to do some of these kind of things. But it does look tough for many of those people at the moment. And you can understand the challenges that they are in. And yeah, I, I so I don't know. I just think it's tough. Um, and I think it's going to be tough for a few years to come, really. Well, that's a cheery note to end on, John. <laughs> thanks for your uh, insights as ever. Um, many thanks to our audience for joining us. We do appreciate you taking time to um, to listen to what we've got to say, and we hope you found it useful and interesting. Thanks for, for your questions. And uh, as we mentioned, there's plenty more analysis from John and our colleagues here at PKF Francis Clark over on our website. So do take a look at that or head to our LinkedIn page if you want to see what the team have been saying over the last 24 hours or so. Um, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, John. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks.